Warren Buffett is widely regarded as the world's best investor, and more specifically, he's probably the world's best bank investor. His investment record in banks is almost perfect. Almost. In Warren Buffett's own words from his 2008 letter to shareholders, he said, During 2008, I spent $244 million for shares of two Irish banks that appeared cheap to me. At year end, we wrote these holdings down to market, $27 million for an 89% loss. Since then, the two stocks have declined even further. The tennis crowd would call my mistakes unforced errors. In this video, let's cover the two Irish banks that Buffett likely invested in in 2008, and also cover what went so wrong to cause this rare blemish on Warren Buffett's investment track record in banking. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe, but for now, let's get straight into the video. Now firstly, let's move from Ireland back to the US for a moment, because US investors have a resource that is incredibly valuable that unfortunately we don't have in Ireland, and that is of course the 13F filing. This is a quarterly filing large investors have to make where they disclose which stocks they own in the United States. And it allows us to get a really good idea of what stocks people like Warren Buffett own. Now, unfortunately, a 13F is not available in Ireland, and we don't know exactly which two bank stocks Warren Buffett bought back in 2008. And to my knowledge, Buffett hasn't ever disclosed exactly which banks he picked uh, to invest that $244 million. But given Buffett's size and just looking back at the relatively small number of Irish banks that were public back in 2008, there's really only three likely candidates to uh, be in that group of two banks that uh, Warren Buffett picked in Ireland. And those are the Bank of Ireland, uh, Allied Irish Bank, and Anglo Irish Bank. And in all three cases, an investment in one of those banks was a complete disaster. If we start with the Bank of Ireland, uh, they received a multi-billion euro bailout package from the Irish government in early 2009. It caused massive dilution for the common shareholder. And just to make matters worse, and this is peanuts relative to the losses that the Bank of Ireland was experiencing at the time, uh, but just to make matters worse, they also uh, had 7 million euros stolen in Ireland's biggest ever bank robbery. The share price for that bank was down 99% in 2008 from its 2007 highs. Uh, even today, it's down 97.5% from the 2007 highs, uh, and likely about 92% down from probably about where Warren Buffett bought it, just based off his comments in that 2008 letter. And if you can believe it, the other two Irish banks that Warren Buffett potentially purchased into had even worse results. Now, uh, Allied Irish Bank was basically nationalized in 2010. Uh, after several bailouts, the Irish government owned 99.8% of the bank. Uh, and Anglo Irish Bank was also nationalized, this time in 2009, uh, and was eventually merged with Irish Bank Resolution Corp in 2011. And again, common stockholders like Warren Buffett effectively lost 100% of their money. So what went so wrong and what was it in the first place that attracted Warren Buffett to make an investment in a couple of these banks, likely somewhere in mid to late 2008? Now to dive into some of the numbers in this video, I'm going to focus specifically on the Bank of Ireland, and that's for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, it's by far and away the largest of the three banks that I've mentioned, and in my view, uh, very likely one of the two that Warren Buffett purchased back in 2008. Uh, and secondly, they're the only one of those three stocks that has remained a public company uh, from 2008 through to today. So we have a very good record of their financial performance and can dive right into the numbers of where things just went so poorly for the bank. So firstly, let's look at some of the numbers for the Bank of Ireland, because quantitatively at least, it's actually pretty straightforward to look at exactly what went wrong with this investment. Banking inherently is a very leveraged business model. Most banks keep a pretty small amount of capital uh, around and that's usually uh, very highly regulated. There are minimum requirements that banks usually have to keep in terms of their uh, equity capital. And a lot of that capital is used basically to service kind of immediate needs for cash that the bank might encounter. For example, if people are just going around paying their daily expenses, or if people want to withdraw money that they have deposited uh, in the bank, the bank needs to have some cash available to give those customers their deposits back. 
Outside of that kind of small amount of regulatory capital, basically banks are taking a bunch of deposits from people that have money, and then they lend that money back out to people who need money in the form of loans. Uh, and they capture a bit of a spread between the interest rate they have to pay on deposits and the interest that they earn on the loans that the bank writes. Now returns on assets in general for most banks are very slim and if we look at the record for the Bank of Ireland in the early 2000s they had a pretty stable return on assets right around the 1% range um, but most banks carry like I say quite a bit of leverage and we can see that the return on equity for the Bank of Ireland uh, was north of 20% for most years in the early 2000s. And that massive difference between return on assets of 1% and return on equity of over 20% really is the first red flag here with the Bank of Ireland. Now, just as a rough rule of thumb, most banks today are leveraged around 10 to 1 uh, in terms of assets to equity. That can vary quite a bit just depending on which country the bank is based in, what type of lending that they do, how it's managed, and a range of other things. But as a rough rule of thumb, about 10 to 1 is where most banks tend to sit. So for uh, the Bank of Ireland to be earning a 20% return on equity with a 1% return on assets, uh, that means they were probably leveraged about 20 to 1 or about double what the typical bank probably sits at today. And we can see that on the chart here. In 2002, they had 4.81% uh, equity compared to their assets. In other words, if we invert that, they were leveraged about 20.8 to 1. And they got increasingly aggressive through the early 2000s to where uh, by 2006, they had only 3.26% equity or were leveraged about 30.7 to 1. Now, you can kind of think about this like owning, for example, a million dollar piece of real estate and only having about $32,000 in equity. If you have uh, small to good you know, returns on assets, that can work very, very well because you get a lot of leverage on that small amount of equity that you have. But if the asset value of that million dollar home goes down to $900,000, for example, you can very quickly quickly wipe out all of your equity and more. And I should say that although not every bank was carrying that amount of leverage in 2008, uh, they weren't alone. So Bank of America, just for reference, was leveraged about 12.5 to 1 at its peak in 2008. Uh, that's a relatively conservative balance sheet by uh, banking standards at the time. And it's probably one of the core reasons Bank of America survived. Um, but if we bring up a couple of more notorious banking names, uh, like Bear Stearns, for example, uh, they were leveraged. 32.8 to 1 in their 2007 annual report uh, and Lehman Brothers were leveraged about 30.7 to 1. Uh, so both of those were pretty much right in line with what we have here in the Bank of Ireland and uh, both of those are pretty notorious and very well known uh, bankruptcies from the global financial crisis. So with the Bank of Ireland at least we have a very leveraged bank that's going to have um, pretty limited resilience should they run into issues with a significant portion of their loans. So uh, what happened next? Well uh, unfortunately for Ireland they experienced a massive burst in a pretty big property bubble, uh, a lot like what happened in the United States around that time. The Irish property index had gone from 72 points in the first quarter of 2000 to 153 points in the first quarter of 2007 and proceeded to go back down about 55% over the next six years. The country also experienced a multi-year recession. They had employment get up to right around 15% at its peak. And, uh, you know, with the economy shrinking, people being unemployed and so on, and a big property bubble bursting, there were a huge number of people that were no longer able to pay their loans to the likes of the Bank of Ireland. And we can see that here in some of the numbers, the non-performing loans for the Bank of Ireland exploded upwards from about 0.5% in 2007 to uh, almost 12% in 2009 and actually continued higher for several years and got right up to about 17.6% in 2014. Uh, again, if we compare that to what seems to be a more conservatively run bank like the Bank of America, uh, they peaked out at about 4.45% in 2009. So the Bank of Ireland had about 2.7 times the percentage of non-performing loans compared to Bank of America and they were also about 2.5 times more leveraged uh, in terms of their balance sheet position. 
And so the bank very quickly started to run out of money and had to be bailed out by the Irish government. And as a result, billions of euros flowed into the bank from the government to try and keep it alive. And uh, through that process, the Irish government basically uh, were kind of purchasing new shares, essentially common shareholders were getting very diluted through this process. So the likes of Warren Buffett were owning a smaller and smaller and smaller percentage of the bank as this bailout process went on. And uh, in 2009, the shares outstanding for Bank of Ireland grew 63%, which is just crazy. Um, what's even crazier is that in 2010, the shares outstanding grew a further 140%. In 2011, they grew a further 312% again. And uh, in 2012, they grew a further 91.7%. So from 2007 to 2014, the number of shares outstanding had grown 33.7 times, uh, which meant that a single share of stock in 2014 represented only 2.9% of the ownership of the bank that it did back in 2007 before this crisis unfolded. In fact, what's really interesting is that at the end of 2021, the Bank of Ireland actually had 66% more equity on their balance sheet than they did uh, before the crisis in 2007. It's simply the massive dilution of shareholders that was required to happen to keep the bank afloat that caused uh, what's effectively become a 100% loss. So what did Warren Buffett, probably one of the best banking analysts in history, get so wrong with these couple of Irish banks? Now, to be completely honest, I'm really not sure why he even touched these banks. Now, obviously, all of this stuff's really easy to say in hindsight, but it was pretty apparent even before he made the investment just how leveraged some of these banks were. And by typical Warren Buffett standards, this bank was way more leveraged than what we've seen him touch with the likes of his big positions in Bank of America. And that leverage works really well when things are going good and you can generate great returns on equity as the Bank of Ireland did in the early 2000s. Um, but when some of your loan assets stumble, which they really did in this case, it can cause really catastrophic results. All I can really think of as to why Warren Buffett might have invested in some of these banks is that one, he perhaps didn't see the property bubble bursting, although that is something that he'd spoken about in the States, um, kind of leading up to the financial crisis, that he thought real estate had gotten really expensive, and perhaps he just underestimated how bad the um, property bubble bursting and the financial crisis could get. It's worth noting that we were already pretty well into the global financial crisis by the time Warren Buffett probably made this investment, so perhaps he did just underestimate how severe things could get. I think it's also possible that Warren Buffett was perhaps seduced by an attractive price. Uh, he mentioned in that comment in his 2008 letter that he made the investment because he thought the banks looked cheap. Um, around when he probably invested in the likes of the Bank of Ireland, uh, it was trading at less than one times book value and had been earning about a 20% return on equity, which is a very, very cheap stock, assuming that they can maintain that level of performance, uh, which they clearly weren't able to, but perhaps that attractive looking price kind of seduced Buffett into, into making the investment. But there are a couple of positives out of this one for Buffett that I think are worth noting. Firstly, um, it was like $240 million, which even though that's a huge sum of money, uh, relative to Berkshire Hathaway's net worth, it was a pretty small bet. Um, he definitely more than made up for these mistakes on some of his other global financial crisis investments. And secondly, he really didn't average down on the stock. You know, when it was becoming clear that the underlying results of the business were just shockingly bad, um, he didn't compound the mistake by, you know, trying to average down, get a lower cost basis, and throw good money after bad. So that is the story of Warren Buffett's venture into the world of Irish banking uh, and a rare mistake from Warren Buffett in the banking sector. I think there's definitely a few things we can learn there about uh, the double-edged sword that is leverage. So I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so that you can catch future content. But that's it from me for this one and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.